I'm Chris Holsinger. I'm one of the head neck surgeons here, and it's a pleasure to give grand rounds. I haven't done this in a few years. Um, and uh, Rob, I've updated the slides. Um, so oh, you have a new slide or two this year. Exa right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, just to keep it fresh. And actually, there, this is a very timely grand rounds. I did not plan it, but there will be an interesting announcement that I make at the end of the talk about uh, robotic surgery in our field. So, um, so uh, thanks for every, everyone for being here. I've entitled this talk Precision Head and Neck Surgery for Oropharyngeal Cancer, Robotics and Beyond, because while I'm excited about robotics, I think the real potential for this for digital technologies to transform all of open surgery and maybe other endoscopic surgeries is really substantial. I think we're truly at a tipping point for a variety of reasons. Um, hello from the division. Um, we're going to add Julia Noel here very soon. Um, Rob, thanks for the invite to come out here. It's been a fun six years, five and a half, six years. And it's been fun to watch the program grow and to have the opportunities to work with great people and have access to Stanford and the technology. Well, thanks for all you've done to help here in the go. Valley. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to talk about a monopoly that, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, conflict of interest in. Um, I, uh, I don't, uh, I, in, the, in the good old days when this rolled out, yeah. in 2009 when this rolled out, I did some proctoring and some teaching and some consulting with Intuitive Surgical. But in 2011, when I realized that in 12 and 13 we're going to launch a national clinical trial, I just decided to cut all ties with them. Uh, and that's for good and bad. I mean, I have three kids coming to college. Um, but in the end, I, I made that choice uh, freely and I think wisely so that I can talk about this space and really, really say whatever I want. And, and I, th I think I would say, even if I were consultants, the same things. But now I, I, there's the sense that what I say is truly what I say. It's not influenced by my money going directly into my pocket. A little bit of advice. I know this is being recorded, so hopefully this can be edited out. Um, th those of you who uh, are, are going to be faculty soon, you have to enroll yourself in open payments. And every one of us can be tracked. And you can see how much money I've been paid by industry. Um, here I am, 2003. Uh, 2013 when this started, 14, 15, 16, 17, I've actually received no money from any company. It's available online. Um, I accepted a university, uh, a visiting professorship uh, at the University of North Carolina. And I found out when I arrived and signed the thing that Stryker was sponsoring my trip. So I received $800 for travel from Stryker in 2014. Thank you, Dr. Pillsbury. Um. <laughs> My suggestion to our faculty when that happens, ask that the company donate to the university yeah. and the university reimburse your travel expenses. That's and they'll I, usually do that. They usually do. Yeah. They usually do. Um, uh, I will talk about some things at the end that are, are touching on a startup that uh, I began uh, now 18 months ago. Uh, and hopefully one day we'll be able to talk about that and in fact use that startup <coughs> in, in everything that we do. Um, but ultimately, this is a story about our specialty responding with innovative technology to an epidemic, the epidemic of HPV-related throat cancer uh, in the oropharynx. And I'm going to take you through a little quick epi review, a little bit about next generation technology, specifically about a new single port system that many of you have heard about. And then talk really about how this is just really a, a launching pad for, again, bringing real time digital enhancements to all surgery you do in otolaryngology. And since we were the one of the original specialties, about the original specialty that brought microsurgery to the all of field of surgery, beginning with um, Holmgren and the, the group in Sweden in the 20s and 30s, I think we are, especially here at Stanford in Silicon Valley, uniquely positioned to transform everything from skull-based surgery and rhinology to open thyroid surgery through a variety of technologies. And I hope that uh, I inspire this group and actually some of that group um, to really think about this as a pathway forward for, uh, for scholarship and, and for dedicating the few hours um, outside the OR and clinics that we have. 
This is a real problem. So 65,000 cases of throat cancer this year. These are the latest numbers published every January by the uh, American Cancer Society. 65,000 cases, if you include larynx and oral cavity insurance. More than 50,000 cases of oral cavity and pharyngeal cancer. And uh, in fact, uh, excuse me, um, in fact, head and neck cancer is now a top 10 cancer among men. Of course, thyroid is now a top five cancer among women. And so our specialty is going to be very much involved in these two epidemics, if you will, that have taken sideline disease from the head and neck and put it into the mainstream. And of course, you know, the reason why, unfortunately, among men, uh, head and neck cancer is the top 10 cancer is this HPV-related uh, epidemic. And you all have seen this slide in, in other talks and my uh, didactic lectures. 225% increase since 2004, uh, sorry, since 1988 to 2004. If the rate of rise continues without a vaccine, um, very shortly um, head and neck cancer, specifically HPV related or pharyngeal cancer, will be uh, a number one cancer among men other than prostate, um, which is a, 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 for non-smoking uh, men, which is sort of a remarkable phenomenon. There has been a completely different way that we approach this disease since I was an intern. I was a medical student. This was a disease that just melted away with radiation. Why would a surgeon ever really want to operate on it? But in fact, and again, this touches on technology instantly. We look at the epi, and then we look at this National Cancer Database trial published by Jen Cracciolo. She's now junior faculty at Memorial Sun Kettering. Um, she published this as a fellow. This is a large data set review from 2004 to, 20, uh, to, to 2013. We looked at about 9,000 uh, patients, almost 1,000 a year, and saw a striking change in the way things had changed since when I was uh, training. We all, especially in Houston, many of the patients that came in, especially with T1 and T2 disease, which this study reviewed, many of those patients uh, a decade before when I was training, all were treated with radiation. And you see here over the exact time period that that um, JCO article I mentioned in the last slide leaves off, we pick up here and follow forward and we see a, a complete divergence in the way that we treat this disease. Many more patients are being treated now with surgery, especially for T1 and T2 oropharynx. And what's interesting is you see this trend developing and then in 2009, 10, and 11, it really, truly picks up. And the divergence in our approach for T1 and T2 um, cancers really begins to, to accelerate this, this difference in approach. Anybody know what happened in 2009 and 10 in the field of technology? Any, any guesses? Any guesses? It was the, the Da Vinci robot was approved by the FDA for transoral otolaryngology. Um, and so what we see here is a significant impact in our field of technology with how we treat this disease. And there will be significant, I think, benefits from our population, but a lot more work that needs to be done. This is the very first TORS case that I did in 2007. Um, it was branded by Greg Weinstein, but I think all of you have heard me say TORS was actually invented by Neil Hochstein, who was a fourth year resident at Penn. His buddy uh, was a cardiovascular surgery resident. And the very first author, uh, the, the, the very first paper was led by Neil Hochstein and Joe Wu. Anybody know who Joe is? <laughs> Rob especially knows. Yeah. It's Rob recruited him as chair of cardiovascular surgery. Joe Wu sponsored the first paper to, to, to test the robot in uh, transoral otolaryngology procedures. And of course, later he got out of that business and went to cardiovascular surgery. But um, this is really a resident-driven project. It started with a resident research project and has evolved into a sea change of the way we treat this disease. You can, you can still do this operation with a bovi and a headlight, and that's a good operation. But the real magic of this procedure is the true precision, that's my title, that this technology brings. You can be macro and then suddenly micro, and you can see the tendon of the medial pterygoid muscle 
in an unprecedented way with clarity and with perspective that really just is not possible with transdural laser microsurgical approach with the carbon dioxide laser or a bogey in a headlight. Does it really, is it worth it? I think it is. We'll, we'll find out and, and look at some data to suggest that um, later on in the talk. But this really marked the beginning of a whole, fee, a whole new field in our specialty. And <clears throat> what led to that uh, 2009 um, FDA approval was this study. It was a multi-center study between Anderson, um, UAB, Penn, and Mayo Clinic, where we looked at 177 patients and saw a very low rate of swallowing dysfunction. There was great concern about catastrophic bleeding operated on the oropharynx. We did not see that at all. And sort of the field was sort of launched from this. But as excited as I am about technology, and I introduced this talk as a talk about technology, technology has sort of unfurled our imagination and allowed our surgical skills to really grow and flourish in a way that had not been possible. But we needed a robot with some really cool new manual dexterity that allows to operate without the confines of the jaw. But vision, I think, plays a critical role. But more importantly, we had to go back to a very old idea of understanding anatomy that we learned from the outside in to relearn that from the inside out. And really, that's what's driven this approach. And as many of you might know, you know, why am I known for this? It's because I, I didn't, I wasn't at Penn. I, I didn't study with Greg Weinstein. I was doing this contemporaneously, but I wrote a paper in English describing essentially an operation that you just saw done with a robot that was done with a bovie and a headlight in France in 1951 by a guy in private practice on the left bank, Pierre Charles Huet. So the plane of Huet that we talked about, Johan's not here, Bureza is. Um, I, I, I named after this guy who showed us the safe way to operate on the warfarynx. And we don't need to talk about that. We'll go over that in the labs. But it's a really interesting story of a really old idea of surgical anatomy using low-tech means really um, uh, rekindled with uh, robotic technology. So it's a great marriage of the old and the new. But really, is this more precise? I think it is. Um, is this a better way to do head and neck surgery? Of course, I'm focusing my talk on oropharynx because we see so many of these, these different patients. Can precision head and neck surgery help play a role in the management of this unexpected disease? And before you know, we sort of launch into that, we have to sort of stop with our, our, our local application of the term precision. I'm using the term precision head and neck surgery. By the way, I think here we do precision thyroid surgery. Um, as well. Um, and where did this term come from? Well, I'm going to tell you a brief story because it's important to understand this. So um, you would think that a doctor coined the term precision medicine. But in fact, it was this guy, a native Utah. I, I don't know the name of the person from Utah. But Clayton Christensen is known best for his term, the uh, innovate, his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, in which he introduced the term of disruptive innovation. And he wrote this book, published in 2009, called The Innovator's Prescription, blending the concepts from the earlier book with just the full train wreck that is modern healthcare, right? And several prescriptions that he makes in this book, we are living in today, and some of those things are really helping us improve what we do. But in fact, it was in this book, and you see the quote here. I'm just going to move this. The chair is blocking the screen. This, this is the exact quote where he says, technology and a better molecular understanding of the, of the taxonomy of all disease, not just cancer, helps us move from intuitive medicine to, to empirical medicine, and then ultimately to precision medicine. And this talk really is not about this, but why I'm using this term and why I think it's so important is laid out really persuasively in this book, and I strongly recommend it. Two years later, without citing this book, the dean of UC San Francisco, who's now in industry, publishes with the National Academies uh, this uh, Toward Precision Medicine monograph, which I, ha I have on PDF, is available to us through the Stanford Library, that talks about that very concept. And then, of course, two, uh, several years after that, we hear four years later Barack Obama in his State of the Union address 
January of 2015, introduced the Precision Medicine uh, Initiative, which has changed a lot of what we do. So how does that apply to us? Most of precision medicine has been about BRAF targeting and molecules for breast cancer and uh, identifying the basis of type 1 diabetes and how we can stratify treatment based on that. Is there any role for us to think about what we do as precision medicine or precision health? These are our, our Dean's uh, coined term. And I think it is. And I think the story actually in our specialty really comes from Silicon Valley and it starts here in 1996 on Ravenswood Avenue where SRI is. This is an original prototype uh, funded by the defense agencies. And this begins with a research project at SRI. And now we have this war of robotic companies. I'm staying out of that, by the way. Um, the opportunities for innovation might lie, lie, lie elsewhere. Um, but now, from that little startup project to this multi-billion dollar industry, these technologies are making surgery more precise, what we do. And I thought I'd just take a brief moment to talk about what's happening in the space, because later I'm going to couch the innovation in, in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery within it. Um, now, Verb Surgical is a joint venture between Johnson & Johnson and Google. Who wouldn't want to put Ethicon and the image analysis and search that's there in YouTube and in image.google.edu with that with, um, with the world's largest medical device company. That's what Verb Surgical is. When two big companies get together, I'm not terribly optimistic that something will interesting quickly result, but let's stay hopeful because I'd love to have Google's search algorithms help me identify nerve better than I currently do using intuitive medicine, my own experience. The next most likely company that will come to the market, I think, in our space is um, Cambridge Medical from the UK. They have this system called Versius. Hanson Medical was a startup founded by Fred Mull, the guy who was testing that prototype at SRI in 1996. Hanson sort of failed and was reborn as Aris. And in uh, January, December, the other unit of Johnson Johnson paid $3 billion for Aris Health. And they are now FDA approved with a system called Monarch, which may have application in, in anterior skull base, to study catheter-based robotic surgery with very fine instruments that will allow pulmonologists and maybe thoracic surgeons to biopsy and treat lung cancer. Super interesting space. And then Titan Medical has sport, and, uh, yeah, and this is a sort of a live demonstration of that. So there is a ton of, of competition and R&D coming to the field of surgical robotics, but I think the next step forward for us in precision head and neck surgery is this system called the single port. Some of you were here for the trial that we did, and I'm going to talk about later in the talk. This is a 2.5, but for those of you who weren't, I'm going to describe what this is. This is a robot um, that is deployed through a single port or cannula that measures about 2.5 centimeter in its greatest diameter. It can deploy three instruments that you see being remotely operated here. And it has a flexible camera that can flex up, down, or to the side up to uh, 30 degrees. That whole cannula can be rotated around. This cannula uh, is docked on a much larger system and is essentially plugged and played into the existing framework that many hospitals use now as the fundamental um, platform for robotic surgery. That was a 2016 paper that, that I published in a laryngoscope and it followed on a 2014 paper in the European Journal of Urology that first tested this device in 2011 in 19 patients looking at robotic prostatectomy and uh, partial nephrectomy. And I think this is an ideal platform for us moving forward for the oropharynx and probably the larynx qualm. I'm not sure about the nose, it's way too big for that. Um, but the uh, footprint of this device approaching the oral cavity <clears throat> suggests that I think we'll have a lot more room to do things than we now can, that we, can, uh, we can't currently do. This is a cadaveric video of that system in action. This is performing Huet's operation. 
um, you see here several different arms deployed. As opposed to having simply two arms, we now have three <coughs> arms. Um, the optics are full 1080p, and um, the, the, <coughs> the ability to move the camera allows us to see anatomy sort of in line with how it's coming uh, more naturally and not have to sort of twist your arm here, turn the camera around there. I, as the surgeon from a single surgeon console, can control the angle of attack of that camera and then rotate the instruments around. I can use one instrument, one instrument to provide traction, the other counter traction. Then I have a third instrument that I control. I don't have to rely on poor Reza fighting the arms of the robot there. I can control and divide blood vessels by putting clips in there. Right? I love it because in the way that I showed you a structure that you probably only vaguely remembered from medical school, the medial ten the, the tendon of the medial pterygoid. I mean, what is the how can you tell the medial from the lateral pterygoid? I mean, who really sees that? Especially in open surgery because of all the bleeding. I mean, not in my, my cases, of course. Right? But uh, this precision, this, the, the optics allow us to very precisely see anatomy that we also might not realize. For instance, that's the styloglossus muscle. And past the styloglossus muscle, that's where the carotid lives. We're out into the neck. We've gone from the mouth to the neck from the inside and the out. And having those three arms in this cadaveric model allows us to do very precise surgery. And imagine how I could see the tumor margin and uh, stay safe with regard to the carotid uh, or go out into the neck where, 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 uh, where necessary. This system allows us to make the human anatomy that we operate on just like it is in a normal functioning upright human being. When we have two hands, like the way we do TLM with one hand, essentially, the way we do TORS as we currently do with the rigid platform, it's a two-handed <coughs> surgery. Now we have three-handed <coughs> surgery, and those three arms allow us to restore anatomy as it is, and it leaves us no blind corners. We can see around the mm -hmm. edges of things and do a much more precise surgery. Thank you to Michelle, who's not here, and to Ryan, who helped describe the very precise dissection you can do with the lingual artery. As many of you know, and the, all of you who have been on the head neck service know, I'm completely focused on absolute hemostasis after these because unfortunately there have been cases of, of fatal hemorrhage following this operation. Did we really not see that we cut the edge of the lingual artery and thought we'd put a clip on it, but we thought it was a small branch? Because in fact, we were pulling this way and the instrument for the clip was coming that way. But if we just pulled more fully, we would see the whole extent of the lingual artery. This new system, I think, will allow us to have that precise visualization and at the moment that we see the vessel, act on it, not rely on a, uh, an assistant or change the camera out. We can control the anatomy endoscopically as we would do so through a transmandibular approach in, in open surgery. But I think what many of us are hopeful for uh, and these are, again, cadaveric videos, I'm going to talk about the clinical trials next, is really could we operate on with two hands, even two hands, the larynx, to suture in the larynx, to provide uh, reconstructive options, uh, even plastic surgical reconstructive options in, in laryngeal surgery. This system here is being used with three arms to operate on the larynx with very crude Technique, Kwong is like saying, yeah, typical head and neck guy, look at it. <laughs> I could do way better than that. Blindfolded, he's thinking. But in fact, we don't have the right instruments, actually. But hopefully, Kwong will get you on this one day. Um, that third arm is pushing the petiole, the epiglottis, up so we can fully visualize the anterior commissure. And the scope is tilted down with two joggle joints so we're in line with the anatomy. So that's how those, those arms help out. And what I really love is this, um, again, this is a cadaveric procedure, um, is this operation showing the complexity of laryngeal anatomy sort of in real time in a cadaver. And it reveals, by having these three arms, that again, we're operating on this almost as if the patient is sitting upright in our clinic. We can see all these different relationships. And I want to just sort of point out a few things, especially for our, 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 our residents and fellows. We have never been able to see that view before. We can see the arytenoid, the AE fold, the false cord, the PE, 
full, the fringo epiglottic fold, we can see the entirety of all of that laryngeal anatomy. We're not going to miss the supraglottic uh, space. We're not going to miss the paraglottic space. We can see this organ as it was meant to be seen, not smashed up with the Lindholm here and someone's pushing there and we're using this, the, the, the microscope at a strange angle to see a little keyhole of the anatomy, right? Or just by doing uh, an open. Even then, you can't see these things because we enter the larynx essentially blind. We're operating on this larynx in its incredible complexity, three-dimensionally, really the way we ought to be doing. And I've not done this operation in, a, in, a, in a, anything other than a human cadaver, but I think this video shows the potential feasibility of having a perspective on all of these anatomical relationships that we just simply haven't had before, facilitated by innovative technology. Love the optics here because as we're coming through, you very easily can see, oh, there's the superior laryngeal artery. And in fact, you can see the little uh, venules on the nerve just anterior to that so you can clip uh, the artery and preserve the nerve anteriorly allowing for a more rapid resumption of sensation and therefore swallowing function. Love this view here where you see the paraglottic space, the laryngeal lumen, and we just approach with full vision exactly where we need to go. The video shows the completion of the procedure on the other side. This video is online to you um, and was published uh, with Ryan Orozco as the first author and Giuseppe Spriano from from now Milan uh, as the senior, and we did this uh, in, three years ago in, in a lab. And here, just to finally finish, uh, um, you see the prow of the larynx from the inside, and you can move the specimen up, look, look at the endolarynx below, follow the cartilage, specimen, cartilage, specimen, and then the whole uh, uh, supraglottic laryngectomy is performed under direct visualization. So very excited about that. We don't see hypopharyngeal cancer very much. This is a potential game changer in Japan and in Korea, where hypopharyngeal cancer is more endemic, related to a variety of factors that I don't understand. And uh, my colleague Ichiro Tatea in, in Kyoto is very interested in using this. In fact, uh, Ichiro and, uh, and Go have published on the use of this technology, uh, showing how we can perform an on block hypopharyngectomy uh, with, with uh, the three arms. I also um, don't perform routinely uh, super cricoid, uh, but my friend Amazing Takayama and also uh, uh, Ryan have put together a very innovative combined transoral, transcervical super cricoid laryngectomy that minimizes the extent of the dissection. I'm not here to talk about that, that tonight, but what I do want to show you, and this also is impressed with the laryngoscope is imagine Kwong being able to do a full reconstructive laryngectomy after a supracricoid laryngectomy. Not just doing the pexy with the cricoid to the epiglottis and the hyoid, but imagine reapproximating the AE folds and then one day with a bioengineered soft tissue graft, putting a true uh, vocal cord in place, connecting from your sutured arytenoid, which you see here, all the way up to, to the thyroid cartilage. I think this is a platform for, for serious innovation. And while I love the supracricoid, the reason it is not done is because vocal outcomes, vocal outcomes compared to chemo radiation are just inferior. Because we just put it together and hope it heals up well. And if you have a lot of experience, it does, and it's not bad. This is a platform for us to continue innovation and provide a more precise reconstruction of an organ um, that we typically radiate because we don't have a good surgical solution. So I'm very excited about that as well, and it's uh, Ryan and uh, Meijin are, are doing some development outside of the robotic platform while we wait for the robotic wars to create a robot just for us in the larynx. They're going to try to solve that with a low-tech solution with wristed instruments and some clever ways of placing uh, sutures. Another instrument, uh, another uh, disease site that is perfectly uh, uh, suited to this and again, I'm not going to talk about this in great detail, is uh, applying this robot, not um, from the side of the head of the bed, but from the foot and bringing those arms in to operate up into the nasopharynx. And my friend Raymond Tseng at Hong Kong U has a really nice paper about that. Um, but that ends sort of discussion of what might be possible and what we've learned in the lab. Those lab experiments were really a prelude to clinical trials 
And in December of 16, that device um, that was essentially born in Sunnyvale in 20, uh, 2007 was tested for the first time in live human patients uh, in Hong Kong. You saw Jason from HKU. Uh, uh, you saw Raymond from HKU here in the last paper. His uh, competitors, really, uh, really from across town, Hong Kong U and CUHK sort of get along, but they're sort of competitors as well. They pooled patients and did this study together, which is really cool. Jason Chan was a, a, a native Hong Kongese who went to Hopkins. He finished a couple years ago. He's gone back to CUHK. And with Eddie and Raymond, uh, they did the first human cases. I had the privilege of being there for those. And this is already published. I think it was published in 2017 in the European Archives of Ovalerology. And you know, they, I think, very wisely started out with simple endoscopic diagnostic procedures, just benign procedures, no cancers requiring a big margin. This is the first, this is a very different platform than what you saw with the first generation of rigid robots. But they showed this was, in fact, a very safe, uh, safe uh, system to operate on the confines uh, of the, the endolarynx and pharynx. Shortly thereafter, um, Intuitive uh, funded an investigative device uh, uh, trial, an IDE trial, um, with 33 uh, patients examined across three centers. Those, this is the number on clinicaltrials.gov, which has now been unmasked. Um, here are the centers. We're one of them. Several of you participated in this. Uh, thank you for that. And um, thank you to Nikita Beatty, who was instrumental in expeditiously um, launching this. Um, we studied this robot uh, beginning in uh, April of 2017 and concluding in October of 2017 um, at Stanford, at Celebration Hospital, Orlando, Scott Maggs, and of course at the University of Pennsylvania with Drs. Weinstein and O'Malley, and also Chris Rasick. These data are going to be presented in full in Austin in a couple of weeks. I'm going to give you a little teaser, because I know all oh, you can't wait to hear about the SPID, I'm sure. Um, but um, I, I collected and we submitted this paper already to the JAMA um, ODO uh, <laughs> publication, uh, this experience, which combines the 14 cases done in Hong Kong um, with uh, 11 uh, cases each from three centers that you saw in the United States. This is the consort flow diagram that every prospective clinical trial uh, really should present. Um, these are the uh, patients, um, seven patients with benign disease from Hong Kong and seven patients with malignant disease were paired with the 33 U.S. oropharyngeal cancer patients and you see uh, the experience shown here. Uh, just a few lessons to take home from this. Um, all of these patients had a very, very high performance status using the ECOG or Zubrod functional assessment. Uh, we insisted on that. Um, and um, they were low risk, ASN, American Society of Anesthesiology score patients as well. You see this distribution of benign versus malignant and the distribution of all the patients here that's really not significantly different among the different institutions. Um, although Scott seemed to operate on more tonsils than the rest of us. Um, here's the staging. You'll notice that uh, most of these patients are staged T1 and T2. Um, those were our criteria, our eligibility criteria for the trial, but two patients that seemed like T2, T2 were actually uh, measured out at slightly greater than four centimeters, so actually included two inadvertent T3s on the study. Low volume neck disease using AJCC um, seven from 2009 for oropharyngeal uh, cancer staging, which as you know, uh, was not specific for HPV positive or negative as it is now um, for AJCC8. Um, here are our results. Again, uh, this is similar to the study that I presented from Oringoscope uh, that led to the 2009 uh, FDA review, but there were no uh, uh, instances of catastrophic hemorrhage. Two patients actually had tracheostomies one from Hong Kong, a patient who had previous um, nasopharyngeal radiation. And Dr. Weinstein included a patient who was really young, who really wanted TORS, but had had a cardiac 
uh, multiple cardiac procedures, was quite obese, um, too many chili feasteaks, and um, um, had really severe sleep apnea, um, but he had just a surgery only, but had a tracheostomy to allow that to happen. Um, all, the, uh, all the patients uh, proceeded with their surgery without uh, complication, and all the patients uh, but two uh, swallowed well, and we saw consistently reliable uh, rates of negative margins uh, using this system. There are some other things that we'll talk about in Austin. I don't want to present all the data here, but I was very pleased. I'll talk about my experience here. I was very pleased with how easy this was to use those three arms and demonstrate what I'd hoped to see from the lab in live human patients. It was a little harder than I thought. There's a significant learning curve when you throw another arm in. Obviously, right? I'm used to two arms. And now, in real time, I'm trying to figure out how to clutch and turn and move the arm in this way. And there's going to be a learning curve with this new technology. But I think it'll allow us to do more precise surgery. The evidence of that, uh, I think Heather presents here. Uh, this is part of the paper and the presentation in Austin. And uh, Heather and hopefully Nilesh are going to look at our uh, long-term follow-up now at 18 months um, from this study. Um, but you sh th this is a review of the MDADI. Uh, the MDADI is the MD Anderson Dysphagia Index. Um, and you see um, a global and a composite uh, patient-reported outcome score preoperatively measuring in the 80s, coming down after a two-week post-op visit, and then returning back up nearly to baseline. Um, for this entire group, for all 47 patients, there was one patient we didn't have full follow-up on. But across this sort of phase two study, uh, we saw complete, uh, nearly complete resumption of uh, swallowing after um, oropharyngeal surgery with, with, with the single port. And so we could go today, uh, well, we could go, yeah, I think, I don't really know what today is. Yeah, we could go today. Um, this device was actually approved for transoral laryngology for T1 and T2 uh, otolaryngology cases. Um, this is actually from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration website. And so, Rob, when uh, you and I meet for our yearly check-in, um, I'll be interested to see if we can build a multidisciplinary collaborative, as we've done in the past, to potentially think about buying SP for us here at Stanford uh, with the gynecologists who are interested, the uh, urologists, and the colorectal surgeons. Um, so, um, so just a, a brief... I'm almost done, but a brief uh, aside, many of you may not know that in colorectal surgery, one of the most innovative things that's being done now is transanal microsurgery. And I've seen that operation done twice now in Hong Kong, and they, hopefully we'll get two robots. They'll have like the, the head and neck robots, colorectal robots. But they use the same concepts of anatomy from the inside out to take away these distal, uh, uh, sort of distal sigmoid and, and uh, rectal cancers in a really transformative way. So nobody's going to buy a robot for, for us, right? We have to have a, a partnership to defray the cost of the potentially expensive system. So collaborative between uh, colorectal and GU and GYN will hopefully allow us to have this technology because the reasons I've outlined earlier in the talk, um, I think it's going to be a game changer for us. All right, 15 minutes to go. I'm going to wrap it up on time. Um, I'm really excited about this, not just because I'm just really excited in general and energetic, but um, this is an interesting time, right? This is the rise of robots. If you read The Economist or if you read the skeptical reports from the Wall Street Journal a few years back, um, how do we really view this technology other than the sort of, look at this photo. It was in the Wall Street Journal. Look at everyone. Yeah. Um, is this a gadget? Is this a gimmick or a game changer? And it, even if it is a game changer, can we afford it? I mean, a two and a half million dollar system, is that a really useful investment for us as a department, as a, a series of, of, of departments of surgery? Should we be spending on other things? I think the answer is yes. I think we think about cost in a very compartmentalized, siloed way. Thank you to Kenrick Tam, who's an intern now, and future otolaryngologist at uh, UCLA, and Nikita and Kalibas and, and the whole crew that you see up there. 
And this was published, uh, I think, at the end of last year in Ringoscope. It actually showed that if you select patients carefully, that robotic surgery is actually a really cost-effective way to treat patients. Yeah, it's expensive resource, just like a linear accelerator is. But if you choose the right patients and minimize unnecessary high-dose radiation or eliminate the need for chemotherapy, these patients treated with frontline surgery actually cost less, quite a bit less, at, at four months and even uh, at a year. What you see here in the graph um, in the pie charts is comparing the costs of frontline chemo radiation in our best attempt to stage match patients who came to Stanford Cancer Center. And you see those patients uh, in black who uh, treated, were treated with chemo radiation, and those patients treated with surgery first in gray. And you see relative to our, our standard treatment, which is concurrent chemo radiation, you see that surgery at four months is actually 25% less. And at one year, we are still actually a little bit cheaper. Now, the patients that I operate on are highly selected. We talked about one just about an hour ago, who's perfect. It's an exophytic tumor. It's like amputating a complex cauliflower uh, off the tongue base. Not every patient is like that, and not every patient should have TORS. I operate on about 16% uh, of the patients that we see. There's plenty of business for everybody to go around, and we can carve out a small percentage of the overall population and reduce costs. This is not a perfect study. I hope Vasu or one of your, your many uh, hinge persons <laughs> We'll take up this and study this a bit better. These costs were really dramatically different uh, here because several patients that I included were patients that had uh, unknown primary tumors that ended up getting a lot of bilateral radiation for midline tongue based cancer. The difference in cost has nothing to do with you know, surgery being cheaper or more expensive than radiation therapy. It's the unexpected visits to the ER, the drop-in infusions on the second floor that suddenly account for all these cost difference, differences over time. And the ridiculous cost of cetuximab, a drug that, as we discussed at uh, uh, Monday last tour, uh, journal club, unfortunately it's not effective for this disease. But we're not here to talk about that. Um, but I hope someone will study that better than I can because uh, you know, I wasn't an econ major like Vasu. I, I, the numbers, you know, they make me nervous. Right? Um, so hopefully we'll follow up on that and we'll study, for instance, a national population to look at those differences because I think minimally basic surgery not only is better for the right patient, it, that approach costs less for the reasons I alluded to. So robotic surgery, we talk about it a lot. It gets a lot of press. There's, you know, a meme that my son showed me about robotic surgery degloving a grape that has trickled down to college students, right? You know, everybody talks about it because it's cool. It's like, you know, having a Tesla, right? But it's, it's so interesting how little of our surgical populations the technology touches. And that's a sad thing to me because I love what it's done for my patients and the value it brings. And so I want to show you. Uh, just a small story and maybe end with a, 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 a taste of what I think is to come. And I want to show you of the 48 million cases performed in the last year that we have good data, 2010, it was published in uh, 2017, there were 48 million cases of surgery performed in the U.S. Now, first of all, that includes cataract surgery, colonoscopy, and EGD. Surgery is loosely defined, okay? So my denominator here is pretty big. And if you look at the total number of surgical cases performed in that year, and you go to intuitive surgical and say, hey, for your volume of all robotic cases done in the United States in 2010, what's the number? Around 300,000. And so believe it or not, robotic surgery, as excited as, it, as we all are about it, because it feels like the future, and as much as it's sort of frowned upon, because it's too cost too much money, it's really add value, et cetera, it accounts for basically 1%, less than 1% of all surgeries. Maybe it rises to 2% if you cut out all the cataracts and the colonoscopies. We're spending all of this time talking about a one per, the 1% of all surgical patients in the United States. It's a foothold. It's a beach hole. It's a beachhead 
for us to apply digital technology to real-time surgery, human surgery. That's why it's cool. That's why we like it. And we're in a great place to study how we might roll this out to the rest of our, our surgical uh, patients in the United States. And so, what you know, this is 1% of the population. And I've been inspired by this guy who uh, came here, Mano Prakash, came from MIT. He literally was in my faculty orientation when I showed up here in the summer of uh, 2013. You know this, you might not know his face or might not know his name, but you know what he invented. He invented a foldable paper microscope to help low resource communities identify pathogens all around the world. Brilliant. And he's released the, the plans and he's developed a whole bunch of other stuff. He's a, the Mechie. Do you know him, uh, Tulio? He was at the Media Lab. Yeah, he's at the Media Lab. So you knew him from there. Super cool idea. Um, we need to take the advantages that we can learn from, from real-time digitization of human anatomy, <coughs> and the innovation that we can build around that, and transpose it to what we do in clinic, to, to, to bring part of that to the rest of our surgical practices, whether that's a microvascular reconstruction, done autonomously or semi-autonomously, a la Tron. <laughs> Steve Hong, did you hear us? Yes. Right? Or other ways to innovate in otologic surgery with Ariscope that uh, Jared and, uh, and uh, Yona are studying, which I saw today when I saw the other microscope, which is super cool, the Orbi, right? Another example of how real-time digitization is disrupting the way we do things. Um. <laughs> Someone approves or disapproves. And, and I think that we ought to start not with the mechanical interaction of our hands to the two. <laughs> oh, someone dialed in. Okay, cool. Um, well, thought I was hearing like things. Pink Floyd album cover. What's that? I like your Pink Floyd album cover. Thank you. Thank you. And I put that in there because my first name is Floyd. Um, <laughs> I was going there, so you set me up, Sam. Thank you. Um, we are inherently visual creatures. And we can figure out a way to do stuff once we learn how to do surgery and hit our stride, right? It's about seeing a little bit better anatomy that we kind of knew, but maybe really didn't fully appreciate subtle differences. Recurrent laryngeal nerve from the many innumerable branches of the inferior thyroid artery vein. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to distinguish them? And this is not, and so I think this is where we start with our moving the, the digital tech that affects only 1% of surgical patients in the United States and bringing that to surgery. And again, we are perfectly poised as otolaryngologists to do this because we helped roll out the operating microscope. And if you don't have those papers, let me send them to you. Email me afterwards. It started in our field. We brought the operating microscope to the OR and then the ophthalmologists and, and the neurosurgeons picked up on it. It's an interesting story. I think we're perfectly positioned to make innovation in surgical vision. And it's not science fiction. This continues. In fact, I saw something in um, like the Palo Alto Weekly this weekend about this study that's still ongoing. Google, working through Verily, which is one of their many subsidiaries, has gone to Indy and has partnered with basically the number one eye hospital, ophthalmological hospital in India. And they have figured out that, I mean, if any of you have, have ever been to any, the volume of patients that come through these centers is overwhelming. The burnout's high, the people who are in the public hospitals don't stay long and they go to this. And so expertise is limited. But the skill is there with those, uh, with those providers. And what they've done is linked the provider's exam and improved it with the digitization of this ophthalmoscopic image and made better early diagnosis using deep learning algorithms to identify ret uh, diabetic retinopathy sooner and the study that I read about this weekend is not only can they do that, can we reduce costs and improve outcomes by finding it earlier? This is a JAMA paper from like 2016, three or less, you know, two and a half years ago. Many of you are aware of how using an archive of 3,000 moles, deep convolutional neural networks can actually identify a, a, a malignant melanoma and, and distinguish it from a benign nevus. Nature Medicine, 2018. Sebastian Thrun 
used to be here in the computer science department. He now has a startup. Rob Naveau, I think uh, uh, John and Fred probably know from the Durham department. What are we doing in our field? Well, uh, Shamik Masharik, who's an undergrad, who just wandered into my clinic and you know what he asked me? So Shamik is the first author on this paper that looks at machine learning as a way to detect the edges of oropharyngeal cancer and I hope one day soon an unknown primary that I have to spend a ridiculous amount of time finding. Shamik walks in and he says, hey, I'm an undergrad from Santa Cruz. I'm a bioengineer, but I'd really like to see robotic surgery with you. <laughs> right? Again, it starts with the robotics and, and it leads us to vision. We showed that using narrow band imaging, which is super low tech, I mean, it's ridiculous how much Olympus probably charges us for this, but it's a green and a blue filter. But when we only look at anatomy without the distraction of glare or too much white light, the multispectral narrow bands that result allow us, using computer vision, to see the edges of tumor in a very predictable way. In fact, in this very early study, machine learning algorithms were able to predict the edge and determine tumor normal with an accuracy of 80% using an AUC curve. And the way it did it is not, is, is not really complex. Computers can see edges just like, uh, where's Davoud? Is his Tesla here? Yeah. Right. So why his Tesla can, can go on the autopilot in an appropriate setting? An appropriate setting is because computers can see edges. They can't really tell tumor versus normal, but the blue and the green light, you know, that's what color is. So if you look at blue and yellow or um, red and green, this came into the simple naive Bayesian classifier that drove the machine learning that could help distinguish tumor from normal. But the most important thing that helped the computer see on its own with a high degree of accuracy in a pilot study, done in clinic for all, and you know how messy that is, was texture. The ability to see heterogeneous textures and edges of tumors, which are clearly abnormal, whether it's exophytic or endophytic, make a very simple observation, something that we can then take into a diagnostic. It helps us move from intuitive to empirical to one day um, precision medicine. And my thesis is that smaller and higher resolution sensors developed for large mass markets which reduce costs so that a little tiny specialty like otolaryngology can study these things quickly and in a transformative way for our patients now, not five years from now, not ten years from now. And we will, by adopting those sensors but also learning about the algorithms, uh, transform the practice of surgery. This is Alex Hagee, he was over at Park, and he designed, he took this multispectral kind of concept and took it to a whole other level. Um, you can classify light in 25 to 50 nanometer bandwidths, bands, and, in, uh, and, and, and many of you have helped out with this as well. We can actually use a hyperspectral image to predict, for instance, what's fat and what's a, a parathyroid adenoma. A simple technology using very pow powerful algorithms and improved sensors that will allow us to very precisely perform our surgeries. And so while robotics has sort of transformed what we do and is now an important part of our multidisciplinary paradigm, and while we have a lot of innovation coming, I think in the future, will take these expensive big technologies and actually use them in our clinical practices and in the OR and I think that will happen soon. And so with that I will wrap up. I think I'm exactly on time. It's 7 p.m. and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.